Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Case Western, Universe, Western Reserve University School of Law's Judge Ben C. Green Distinguished Lecture in Law. I'm Professor Raymond Koo, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Law School, as well as co-director of the Law School Center for Law, Technology, and the Arts. I'm pleased to welcome our guest speaker today, Mr. Robert M. Chesney, uh, the Charles I. Francis Professor in Law at the University of Texas School of Law. It is also my great honor uh, to welcome Ms. Roe Green, a great friend of the Case Western Law School. Roe is the daughter of, of the late Judge Ben C. Green, an alumnus of the class of 1930, and his late wife, Sylvia Green. In 1961, Judge Green was the first law school graduate to receive the prominent appointment uh, of federal judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Appointed by President John F. Kennedy, he served in that role for 20 years. Uh, Judge Green uh, was highly regarded in his profession and his community and possessed a true passion for legal education, politics, and public service as exemplified by his long judicial career. Fortunately for the School of Law, he also inspired the extraordinary philanthropy of his late wife and his daughter, Roe. Uh, who together established the Ben C. Green Visiting Professorship, which is now, in fact, a chaired professorship held by Kevin McMonagall here at the law school. Uh, later, Roe, on behalf of her family and in honor of her late father, gave the largest individual outright gift ever received by the law school for its significant library renovation, and then went on to endow the lecture series which we were, that brought us all here today. Roe also continues to be one of Northeast Ohio's most dedicated philanthropists giving to our region's arts and cultural institutions. We're most fortunate to be the beneficiaries and the generosity of this extraordinary person and her extraordinary family. Uh, Roe, if you'd please stand. Thank you so much, Ms. Green, for all you do for the law school and for Northeast Ohio. Uh, now, let me turn things over to Professor Robert Strassfeld, Associate Director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center and the Director of the Institute for Global Security, Law, and Policy, who will introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ray. And uh, let, my, let me add my thanks to Ro Green uh, for making this event possible. Uh, and my thanks to all of you for attending. I think um, you will be glad that you have. Um, I want to keep this brief uh, because I think you'd rather hear from Bobby than from me. Uh, Bobby Chesney is the Charles I. Francis Professor in Law at the University of Texas School of Law. He is a prolific writer on a variety of questions uh, in national security law. Uh, he has not one but two books in the works on um, national security law issues, uh, uh, terrorism and the coercive power of the state, and also the evolving judicial role in national security affairs, both um, uh, to be published by Oxford University. University Press. Uh, he also served on the Justice Department's um, task force on detention policy. Uh, and it is, it is with regard to questions of detention policy uh, that he is here today to speak to us. Uh, all of us who are interested in issues of national security law are incredibly um, in Bobby's debt. Uh, this is a field of law uh, that is exploding at an unimaginable pace and keeping up is uh, an incredibly daunting task. Uh, Bobby has uh, kept all of us informed uh, through a uh, listserv uh, in which he analyzes not only all of the relevant case law as it emerges, which is more or less a daily affair, uh, but also relevant scholarship in the area. Uh, we would be a whole lot dumber about these <laughs> subjects if it were not for Bobby and I am very grateful for that. Uh, without further ado, I am going to get out of the way um, and let you hear from Bobby Chesney. 
Thanks, Robert. In fact, that was so nice. That's probably. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here today. As I mentioned to the faculty earlier, I've, I've had a, one prior trip up to Case in Cleveland, which was a really wonderful experience a couple of years ago, and I was very impressed with the intellectual vitality of the place and the faculty. Um, and also, being a big San Antonio Spurs fan, I feel that now I can have, well, wait until you hear what I have to say. We have common cause in our mutual desire to see the Miami Heat relegated to the dustbin of history this year. Uh, but my talk is not about LeBron or the NBA generally. Uh, rather, I'm here to talk about detention law and policy. Um, I want you to feel free if I, if I uh, say something along the way that strikes you as wrong or strikes you as unclear. Uh, I'm happy to, to interrupt and, and to engage as we go, um, but I will make a point of saving as much time as possible at the end for Q&A. I know this is a topic that people are passionate about uh, and feel strongly about, and I'm eager to hear what you have to say, and, and don't hesitate to, to push back or to criticize or to simply express your own views. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what, what you all have to say. Now, before I, I begin, let me, let me also echo the prior comments in thanking Ms. Roe Green for making this event possible. I'm very, very grateful to you and for all that you do. Thank you very much. So, without further ado, um, the question uh, the, the talk title refers to is a question about the substantive scope of the government's asserted power to hold people in military custody without criminal charge. It's a, it's a question that hasn't received quite the attention that it perhaps should in recent years, largely because we've been focused on questions of jurisdiction. Do, do courts have the authority to review detention decisions? Those battles have been fought off and on since 2001. They're essentially resolved now at Guantanamo, and we're moving on to other questions that incredibly we haven't resolved despite the passage of nine years since 9-11. It's, to be clear, not my purpose to talk about the evidence against particular individuals, whether or not the government can show that someone is who they claim that person to be, nor is it my intention to talk about the questions of procedure and evidence law that arise in connection with Guantanamo habeas uh, proceedings where the judges review individual detention decisions. Instead, I'm interested in talking about the scope of the power to detain. Now, um, I will get into a lot of detail. Most of this talk is descriptive, and it's, it's my effort to give you guys a really firm grasp of just what judges have done in construing the scope of this authority over the past nine years, and to, a lesser, and to some extent also what the president, uh, two presidents and various congresses have said about it as well. But before we get to that, I think it's helpful to frame the discussion with a bit of abstract uh, overview. So towards that end, I want to I flag a series of disputes that collectively account in substantial part for why this debate seems to go on, go on unresolved year after year for the better part of a decade. First, there is a great deal of disagreement as to which bodies of law govern this question. Second, even when there's agreement or within areas of agreement about which bodies of law apply, there's disagreement as to what those particular bodies of law say, the law of armed conflict or the laws of war, what they have to say on this particular subject, if anything. And then all this is taking place in a context in which the always thin line between describing what the law is and arguing for what the law ought to be or should become seems especially unclear, in large part because of the uncertainties here. Let me, let me unpack each of these points a little bit more. Uh, with respect to the debate over which bodies of law apply, there are many possibilities. One possibility is that the question of who may lawfully be detained without charge should be determined only by looking to uh, American law, the Constitution, statutes, uh, treaties, uh, anything that can be described as supreme law of the land in terms of the Constitution. Or we might look more broadly to the law of armed conflict, or she might look at both. The law of armed conflict, of course, or, or LOAC is the abbreviation I'm using in these slides, is, is a name that, that the military uses for something that in academia we also often refer to as international humanitarian law, IHL, but more to the public I think it's best recognized as the laws of war. It's the body of international law that uh, regulates and constrains the use of force in armed conflict. <laughs> Other possibilities, let's not forget international human rights law, a separate body of international law. Um, applicable at all times by and large, but with a complex relationship as to when it governs when there is armed conflict. Um, and of course, 
within each of these bodies of law we find disagreement and let me give you an example focused on the law of armed conflict. Uh, several theoretical positions are possible here. When one goes looking within the body of the law of armed conflict for an answer to the question of who is it the United States can hold, if anyone, militarily without criminal charge, it's possible you might find that the law of armed conflict is applicable yet doesn't provide an answer to that question. Or we might find the law of armed conflict is determinate. It provides an answer, and that answer is narrower than the scope of authority that the government's been asserting. And so a judge might then enforce that limitation. Or conversely, the judge might determine the law of armed conflict applies. It's determinate, and it's at least as broad, if not broader, than what the government's been asserting, and therefore it doesn't really constrain what's going on. And perhaps most likely of all, we might find that it's a mix of the above depending on the circumstance. That is to say, we might say the most accurate description is the law of armed conflict sometimes applies and in some contexts where it does apply it provides a determinate answer and otherwise doesn't and it turns out this is not going to be amenable to a one-size-fits-all solution. You can probably guess that I'm, I'm going to lean in that direction. Uh, <laughs> stacking the deck as it were. Now, having said all that, um, let me make some broad claims about the lessons of the descriptive account that I hope you'll draw from this. Uh, the Guantanamo habeas litigation, of course, is a fact-finding process. It's a process of deciding whether the government truly has enough evidence to show that particular detainees are whom the government claims them to be. And the ones who are litigating these cases are, by and large, denying that they are who the government claims them to be. So yes, it's a fact-finding process. And that in itself, of course, is terribly important. It's, it's obviously of great importance to the government and especially the individuals who, uh, whose freedom is at issue. It's also a lawmaking process. And that's the more interesting aspect of it that I want to highlight for you. The fact of the matter is that in the course of making these factual determinations for Guantanamo detainees, the courts are developing law of procedure, law of evidence, and substantive law, including law on the question of who may be held. Further, yes, please. Uh, but I mean that lawmaking process is being made by the people who you said are doing the fact-finding in the habeas litigation? That's what I'm suggesting. You're suggesting what you're saying is so one of the questions that we'll come to in the conclusion is if you accept that there's some degree of rulemaking and, and of course you know we all appreciate a lot of times the litigation process in the common law manner is going to be generating legal rules or evolving okay, judgment judgment law yes yes oh, okay. yes, yes. Right. yeah okay that's that's where I'm going with it no 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 I meant I meant the judicial rulings absolutely <laughs> glad for the clarification but it does but you but you raise the larger question you know are we comfortable with the status quo and that's one of the questions I'm going to leave on the table at the end um, would it be better to have legislation are there reasons to, to favor one or the other yes um, this is beyond simply relevant, this is not just relevant to detentions at Guantanamo, and it's not just relevant to the question of detention. It's not just relevant to the realm of military operations undertaken under the authority of the AUMF authorization for use of military force that Congress enacted a week after 9-11. A lot of the, the litigation and a lot of the rulemaking that's going on speaks to the law of armed conflict more generally in the context of as you see there, NIAC, non-international armed conflicts. And, and what I'm saying there is that the issues that the courts are grappling with have really broad application for war fighting generally in the context of counterinsurgency and these sorts of internal conflicts and irregular warfare scenarios we seem to be involved in of late fairly often. It's not just about detention, by the way. A lot of what we're going to see in the, in the moments ahead has implications for the use of lethal force. So if you think about drone strikes and the like, targeting of individuals with lethal force, there are implications and connections here as well. So where to begin with my descriptive account? You know, it's, it's tempting to, to say, in the, you know, well, a century ago. We could, we could begin this story so far in the past, but for the sake of time, I'm going to bring us up to the 9-11 attacks and one week later, Congress authorizing the use of military force in what I'm going to refer to going forward as the AUMF, the AUMF, the abbreviation for this uh, statute. What did it confer? Well, its language is very broad. It refers expressly to the president having authority to use, quote, all necessary and appropriate uh, force against whom? Well, that's the question. And the AUMF itself does have something to say as to who the objects of military authority under the statute are. Um, 
In practice, it's relatively clear, at least at the group level, whom this statute or this force is directed at. What it actually says is the president is to determine which state, non-state actor or individuals perpetrated the 9-11 attacks and force is authorized to be used against them to prevent a recurrence and it's also authorized against any state individual or non-state actor that's uh, harboring such persons and by and large we've moved to a point of I would say national consensus that at a minimum this is a reference to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Uh, you notice I have the phrase associated forces up there as well. There are, we could have a whole separate discussion at the group level of uncertainty as to just who is encompassed at the group level, given that Al-Qaeda itself is not exactly a hierarchically clearly defined membership organization, but rather is best characterized as a network with many affiliates and offshoots and like-minded but entirely distinct individuals and groups. We, we could go on and on about that, but that's not my main focus. I want us to just accept for the sake of argument at least that we have some degree of clarity that whatever con Congress accomplished here, it was directed at least at Al-Qaeda, whatever that turns out to mean, and the Taliban, whatever that turns out to mean. And further, I'd like you to accept that at this point, there's relatively little dispute that this statute conferred at least some authority to detain without charge, at least somebody somewhere, that it didn't convey, convey zero authority. Now, we know this to be true because the Supreme Court it, in 2004 in Hamdi v. Rumsfeld said, at least in the context of a person who was bearing arms on the battlefield in Afghanistan, now, separate question whether that person had really done that, but at least in that context, that person is subject to detention, at least so long as armed conflict in Afghanistan continues. The interesting question is, who else? Is it just the de facto government of Afghanistan at that time and its arms-bearing fighters? What about al-Qaeda separate from that? Is it, it's not a state actor or de facto government of anything. Does that mean that no one from al-Qaeda can be detained? Um, what if they're not captured in Afghanistan? What if a person's captured far away from any zone of conventional sustained combat operations that by and large people will agree constitute armed conflict and trigger traditional notions of detaining the enemy rather than just shooting the enemy during armed conflict? That's, that's the hard question. So, Again, let's accept that Al-Qaeda and the Taliban notionally are covered. The really interesting question at that point is, all right, fine, who is sufficiently associated with these organizations to come within the scope of the resulting detention authority if there is any? The AUMF doesn't say anything about this, nor, to be fair, does any prior AUMF Congress has ever enacted, and it's enacted many of these over the years, nor, for that matter, any of the, the smaller number of declarations of war. Do any of them say anything about this question of what I will call individual detention criteria? And what I'm getting at is the idea that there must be some standard. There must be some way of knowing which persons of the billions in the world are within the scope at an individual level of this authority and which ones aren't. The AMF doesn't talk about this. The reason it never does in the past, of course, is that usually this isn't a big issue. So if you imagine World War II and a conventional armed conflict, uh, America against Imperial Japan and the armed forces of Imperial Japan, it, it's relatively clear who, on the battlefield who the members of the Imperial Armed Forces of Japan are when you encounter them in uh, Iwo Jima or someplace like that. And in any event, to the extent that one has been captured, one would have every incentive in order to obtain POW status to announce, in fact, as your uniform indicates, you are a part of the enemy's armed forces. That's not our situation at all here, not remotely our situation. Even in the context of conventional, or at least quasi-conventional co combat operations in Afghanistan and other places, um, we're dealing with an enemy that, if you found the right person, is certainly not gonna say, oh, I indeed was a Taliban fighter, because they're not going to be treated as a POW as a result. They're not, quali they're not deemed to be qualified for POW status. They don't have any incentive to do it. And in fact, their best bet is to deny that they're a Taliban fighter and to say that, no, in fact, you've got the wrong person, as indeed is bound to be true more often in this scenario, precisely because we're dealing with people out of uniform. In short, the risk of false positives is far higher and inevitably far higher in this context than it would be in a conventional war. Now, that is true of past conflicts. We've had, it's not like guerrilla warfare or fighting out of uniform was invented by Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. It wasn't a big deal before that AUMFs and declarations of war didn't spell out individual detention criteria despite this. Why not? Well, 
it could have been a big deal. And, and as, as Robert and I were talking about earlier uh, today, you know, in Vietnam, this was an issue, but it never became anything like the issue that it is today. It's not central. I would submit in large part because the larger context was what looked to everyone like conventional combat operations, conventional war. And the larger context here, at least removed from Afghanistan and at least for a while Iraq, uh, doesn't look like that. And that's where so many people object to the invocation of traditional warfare models. That in, in any event, whether it should have been raised as an issue before is rather besides the point. It's obviously a front uh, and center issue today. So the AMF, it would be nice if it said something about this, told us what the detention predicates were at the individual level. <coughs> it doesn't. And that opens up rather a can of worms for us to deal with. So I'd now like to talk about what first the executive branch interpreted the individual detention predicates to be and how the courts have reacted to that over time. Um, somewhat arbitrarily, I'll start off in mid-2004, about the time it became relatively clear to the public what standard or conditions the Bush administration was <coughs> relying upon. Uh, it was framed as the definition of enemy combatant, and this is what the Bush administration largely throughout its time was using as its criteria. You could be detained. Individuals are subject to detention on either of two conditions. So these are two separate sufficient conditions to be detained. One is a membership test or associational status. If you are part of certain groups, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban Associated Forces, simply if you're part of those groups, regardless of what your conduct may have been, your associational status alone would get you detained or would warrant your detention on this model. And then separately, entirely independent of that, maybe you're not part of these groups, but if you provide support to these groups, this form of conduct also would warrant your detention. And although I don't have it up on the slide, uh, and here are the groups, just to remind us, I don't have it up on the slides, but the definition always would make a reference also to people who actually directly participated in the fighting. So what I want you to think of is simply a two-track model, membership or past conduct, including not just fighting, but just giving support to a group. So think if you, if you send a check to a group, you send a check to Osama bin Laden, you could be detained because you've provided support to al-Qaeda. That's the model here. Well, um, let's fast forward a bit. Or actually, before we do that, let's, let's think about how my original questions map onto this. The government has made its claim as to what its authority is. From a legal point of view, the question this raises is, are they allowed to do that? Legally speaking, is this claim of authority within legal bounds? We need to know what bodies of law control. Does the Constitution apply here? Does it have something to say? Uh, does the law of armed conflict apply here? What does it have to say? Does international human rights law apply here? Does it have something to say? Does the Non-Detention Act from the 1970s, does federal statutory law apply here? All these bodies of law, we need to know if they apply. Then we need to figure out if they do apply, what they have to say. And we may find that they may not say a lot about individual detention criteria. They, they may apply and yet prove not to be very helpful to answering our question. <coughs> And again, don't forget, we're in a context in which there's a lot of pressure for what we might call norm entrepreneurship, which is to say arguments for advancing new positions in the law, sometimes explicitly and sometimes under color of arguing that the law already covers this fact pattern. And to be clear, I know from past experience when I say that, some in the audience will think, aha, He's criticizing the left, suggesting the left is disguising arguments for what the law is, disguising their arguments for what they want the law to be, for what the law is. And then people on the other side of the aisle are saying, aha, he's criticizing the right for doing the same thing. I'm actually criticizing both. I think the law is fairly, ind fairly indeterminate on some areas of this particular question. And I think that on both sides of the aisle, there is a tendency to make arguments that, to make the argument that all we need do is just apply the law. Just apply the law and we'll be fine. And I'm suggesting to you that that will actually be quite hard to do because of the degree of indeterminacy in all these bodies of law on the particular question of individual detention predicates. And so there's an inescapable amount of rulemaking that's going to have to go on. It could be left to the executive. It could be left to the judiciary. Congress could step in. Let's see what's actually happened. The issue, I'm skipping over some amount of activity that occurred between 2002 and 2008 largely for the sake of time. If you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about some of the earlier rulings in this area. They're very interesting. But let's jump ahead to the year 2008, which was the year of a very important Supreme Court case, Boumediene versus uh, Bush, in which the Supreme Court famously held that Guantanamo detainees 
uh, regardless of citizenship, regardless of the formal sovereignty of Cuba or the United States over Guantanamo, they get habeas review. The Constitution requires it, and it's got to be meaningful. What a lot of people don't appreciate is that in the petition for cert to the Supreme Court, there was a second question presented. It wasn't just about jurisdiction. There was also a question presented about what the substantive scope of detention was. Once, the deten once you get to the merits, what's the test? And, and just to clarify, because I worry sometimes that the arguments are so familiar to me that I, I may not be as clear as I think I am. I'm sure that's the case. I'm not as clear as I think I am. Um, we're, what we're engaged in here is rather like trying to figure out in a criminal prosecution setting, what exactly is the crime that can be charged? What's the criminal activity? How have we defined the crime? We're not talking about the evidence in particular cases or what the trial procedures or the rules of evidence are. We just want to know what the offense is defined to be. That's the question that's indeterminate or, or not addressed very clearly by the AUMF and which I will now show doesn't get a lot clearer upon judicial review. So the question was put to the Supreme Court and it was put in an interesting way. The, the petitioners, Lakhtar Boumediene and his, and his co-petitioners presented a very interesting argument. They said to the court in their merits brief, first of all, this should be determined with reference to the law of armed conflict, thus answering the question of what, what body of law applies here. Law of armed conflict treats international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict differently. There are many more treaty <coughs> rules for international wars than there are for internal or non-international conflicts, or NIAC as I have it as an abbreviation on the slide. Uh, and one of the things that, that many commentators say about NIAC is there's no such thing as a combatant, meaning no one has the privilege of being a soldier in the NIAC setting, at least the, 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 uh, certainly the insurgent side or the belligerent side, the non-state uh, side does not. And so there's no combatants, there's only civilians. And they said further, that doesn't mean no one can be detained. These people are civilians, but they can be detained when DPH, anybody know what DPH stands for in, in the law of armed conflict? I won't call on anybody, stay off in class. Direct participation in hostility. It's a term of art in the law of armed conflict that's used to figure out when a civilian can be shot at. So think of Rosie the Riveter in World War II. Um, she's a civilian. She's not in the Army, but she works at a factory putting together B-29s or something like that. Um, she's not directly participating in the fight. She's indirectly helping the fight. She cannot be shot at. She's not a target. She's a civilian. That doesn't mean you can't bomb the factory she's building B-29s in. She may be there when that happens. But you certainly can't follow her home and shoot her. She's a civilian. Civilians can only be shot if they directly engage in the hostilities. That's what DPH means. And the Boumediene petitioner suggested to the court, you know, that might be a useful concept here to map onto who can be detained. Um, of course, it turns out, inevitably, there's huge debate amongst law of war scholars as to what counts as direct participation. As you might imagine, some have argued for very broad notions of what direct means. Um, you know, leave it to us lawyers to come up with a, a way to problematize the meaning of a word is direct as <laughs> direct. We can think of analogies. Um, so uh, here's the argument they offered. They said, first of all, there's a clear core, right? It's, it, it's got a core meaning everyone agrees about. Immediate and actual action on the battlefield that, you know, this is, this is literal direct participation. They say, of course that's covered. If you've got somebody doing this, fighting on the battlefield, go ahead and detain them. Of course, that was not true for them. I should add that Lakhtar Boumediene and his colleagues had been captured in Bosnia. They'd been arrested by uh, Bosnian authorities after the U.S. gave information to Bosnian authorities suggesting they might be planning a plot to attack a U.S. consulate. The Bosnian court began a criminal process, but because there was inadequate evidence, the indictment was effectively dismissed, at which point is they were whisked away into U.S. custody and flown to Guantanamo. That's not a combat capture context, to say the least. These guys aren't charged with having directly participated in hostilities in any sense. What else did they argue? They said further that you don't actually have to catch a person in the act of doing the fighting. We're, and you start to see how clever the litigation strategy is. They, they're offering as much to the justices on the court, the mu as much authority for the government as possible without encompassing themselves. So they say in addition to direct battlefield participation, people who've done that and who repeatedly do it, they're sort of always directly participating. Thus to avoid the response from the government that it's not fair to let someone be a farmer by day and a fighter every night and we have to somehow catch them in the act. Um, they say fine, capture the farmer by day, fighter by night, that's still not us. And further, senior leadership figures who are more responsible, arguably morally, more culpable than even the, the, the frontline fighters, 
they're always on too, civilian or not. So you can have Osama bin Laden and, and other leadership figures, because after all, what litigator is going to go to the Supreme Court and think the court's going to accept a definition that doesn't cover Osama bin Laden, right? Just as a matter of litigation strategy, this is smart. This is an argument that helps your client but doesn't actually uh, have no chance at all. And they even wrote this, and I'm quoting here as you can see, conceivably this might even cover others who submit themselves to the direction and control of the organization like Al-Qaeda. Their view was whatever the government might be able to prove was, was at best sort of fellow traveling, like-minded persons who share some of the same ideas and interests and may have been planning something but we're not in the chain of command of Al-Qaeda. That there would be no way to show that Osama bin Laden gave an order and these guys were carrying it out. It's, it's very clever. It, it provides a maximum amount of detention authority to the government as far as they're concerned. Still doesn't cover them. So leaves them out. Well, long story short, the court declined to rule on this issue altogether. It was presented and then Justice Kennedy said, in effect, that'll be dealt with on remand as all the habeas cases begin to spill forth in the district court initially. This is in the summer of 2008. What has happened since? Well, picking up the pace a bit, I'm going to take you through a series of phases, and I'll quickly outline what the district judges have said about this. Then I'll show you how the D.C. Circuit has more recently begun to react. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the aftermath of those rulings. Um, here again is the Bush administration's definition of who may be detained. Remember, it's members and it's supporters. Pretty simple. Uh, the first case to, to deal with this was on remand in Boumediene itself. Judge Leon, Richard Leon, said, that works. That definition will work. So here's, there's your first position, which basically just accepts that membership and support are equally valid, equally sufficient conditions for detainability. Then you get a change of administrations. And many people just assumed, of course, the Obama administration will adopt a different standard, right? Well, he appointed this task force that, that I was involved with. Um, and while the task force is busily working away on its issues, uh, the litigation docket in the habeas cases requires briefs to be filed. And by March 13, 2009, the new administration, very new, many appointees not yet even nominated, let alone confirmed in office. You know, Harold Coe is not yet at the State Department, for example. Uh, has to file a brief. So here's what they changed. Oh, that was quick. Wait, I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> what changed? Substantial. Substantial. Both tracks are kept. Membership or support. Support's been clarified. Now, de minimis support is now formally out. We, we, I used to you know, kind of make a joke about that. And then I thought, well, no, there, there may have been some fact patterns where that might have been relevant. But in any event, uh, there was more to this. Uh, there was nomenclature change. Uh, the word enemy combatant, you notice, drops out of the header there. Uh, that, that verbiage is now taboo. It's got too much baggage. That sounds like the last administration. Um, there's no new word if you're looking for what's the new catchphrase. They very cleverly decided not to offer one because that would just be the hook for baggage. So there's no, there's no catchphrase. You've got to say all this if you want to refer to what the standard is. Membership and substantial support. Uh, there is also a, an express acknowledgement that the law of armed conflict is relevant. Although there's not also a further elaboration as to exactly what, in what way that's actually going to mean anything, but it's relevant. Um, so the courts have to respond to this. Now you've got Judge Leon having said that material support and membership, those are adequate. Judge Walton in the Garibay case, it's a painfully complex opinion to pour through. Let me distill it to its essence. First of all, he rejects the petitioner's argument that the AMF has simply nothing to say about detention, does not give a detention authority for a non-state actor. He says, no, no, that's, that's, that's a bridge too far. Clearly Congress thought there could be non-state actors involved here. They're referenced in the statute. If there's detention authority, it can apply to them in theory. He says further that the law of armed conflict, you don't need to point to something affirmative in the Geneva Conventions or otherwise. You just need to make sure there's nothing in this body of law that tells you you can't do it. That's a pretty important distinction. Further, he says absence, well, he explains it, in the absence of a further express authorization for detention authority, that, that doesn't really tell us anything. We still need to go looking for an answer here. He says the AMF should, is best understood as conferring not just the power to kill, but also the power to detain. And he expressly says you should never interpret a statute, unless you have to, to confer the power to use lethal force without also bearing with it the power to detain as an alternative. Uh, but who may be detained? And he says as to this, I note that the detainees arguing for this DPH test. And this particular detainee argued for that, plus 
and membership requirement as well for good measure. He said, well, DPH is, is not the measure, but I like this idea that you have to be part of an organized armed force. There should be not just an organization, but an organized armed force. And you've got to be, those people can be attacked and detained at any time. And notice there, he's, he's treating it as targeting and detention turning on the same standard. Um, what counts as an organized armed force? Well, you've got to be in a structured role in the hierarchy. You've got to be in the chain of command which means you have to be subject to orders. And it's got to be, he wrote, in the combat apparatus of the organization, thus introducing an important and familiar and contested distinction for a lot of these non-state actors that we're dealing with here, the distinction between their militarized wings and their political and social wings. And he's accepting that that's meaningful in at least some of these contexts. Detainability attaches to people in the chain of command of the militarized wing. Um, and if you're an independent supporter, he says, that doesn't count. You've got to satisfy the structured role in the combat apparatus test. And you can call it support, but that's what you've got to do. So he effectively rejects the support track. Yes, ma'am? Does that mean, like, unless you're carrying a gun or something? What about intelligence people who it's, are not armed? I, I would think that, you know, he didn't say specifically how he'd answer that question, but I would think if he were here, he would say, no, I mean, I mean you don't have to be fighting, right? But it's got to be the militarized wing. If you're engaging in intelligence or other activities for the combat wing or the, the wing that uses violence, but your, your question gets at, and I, I, can, I can see you thinking, well, where's the line, right? What if you supply food to them? What if you're just in, engaging in intelligence well, then you're not in the chain of command, according to that hypo, and he would say you don't fall within the test. You've got to be in the chain of command of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. You have to be subject to their giving you orders, and it's got to be part of the militarized wing. So if you were an, a Taliban diplomat, wouldn't count. If you're not part of any group, it wouldn't count. If you're part of some other group, wouldn't count. That's what he's suggesting. How about Al-Qaeda in Yemen? Right. So earlier I talked about how there's, or there's still uncertainty at the group level. There's a whole host of groups that, said, that have al-Qaeda in their name these days, including some, especially in the Maghreb, that have very long-standing records of, of, an, of activity well before they put al-Qaeda in their name, but now have branded themselves and formed these almost franchise-like relationships. One of the most important issues currently today is whatever you think about the individualized criteria I'm talking about here, <laughs> then there's the further question of, okay, you've proven this guy's a member or is in the chain of command of a franchise. Does that count? And I suspect you have in mind the targeted killing case involving the American, uh, Al-Alaki, and that is a huge issue in his case. One could take the position that a person who's in Al-Qaeda can be targeted, but the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is not al-Qaeda for purposes of that authority. Many people would take a different view and say, no, there's not enough difference between them. They're all one group. Especially since the September 18th law didn't name the groups, right? The it others. didn't name the groups. What it did, it did give a test. I mean, to think in terms of the non-delegation doctrine for our common law students in the room, there is an intelligible principle here for what the group that's been, the president can name as subject to this authority is. It's got to have a nexus back to the 9-11 attacks. But that, we're all lawyers, we can make that fit a lot of things. A lot of things having nexus back, it depends on how demanding the nexus has to be, right? Sir? How, how can you uh, separate Al-Qaeda from the Arabian Peninsula when Osama bin Laden himself went back to Africa after getting kicked out of Saudi Arabia to recruit and rebuild Al-Qaeda before, you know, Al-Qaeda became like a franchise name, so to speak? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, certainly, certainly Al-Qaeda has been in different locations. I'm not sure that determines, I mean, there's, a, there's an empirical... I mean, it sounds like, and maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like when you say Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, you're implying, at least to some extent, Osama bin Laden, correct? Like, no, like no. Let, let, me, let me clarify what I'm talking about here. Um, most folks who follow this refer to uh, AQ, there's Al-Qaeda Central, right? The, 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 the original Al-Qaeda, the, the high command that was thought to be essentially located with its key leadership personnel in the, the, the Fatah region in Pakistan. There are groups that in various ways have links, have links or associations back to Al-Qaeda Central, some of which use Al-Qaeda in their title as well. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in Iraq being, AQI being an especially important one, but Jamaa Islamiya, there's, there's a whole host of groups that to varying degrees have these ties. And, one, and so we think about, well, if we, if we agree that Al-Qaeda is covered at the group level, does that mean that everybody who has some degree of association with Al-Qaeda is all sort of tarred by the same brush or, or connected to the authority? Um, you can certainly make arguments that, that they should be. 
or that there should be a strict approach. But the important point for present purposes is the AUMF certainly doesn't tell us how to grapple with the factual nuances among them. And, and the, it's not probably enough just to say a, AQ, Al-Qaeda, is in the title. But I may not have responded on point to your, to your question. I'm sorry if I misunderstood. No, it's fine. I just, thought, I just felt like you were saying that there's a difference between Al-Qaeda and, and the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda outside of the Arabian Peninsula. I'm saying that that's a question, that, that <coughs> some people think, obviously, at a minimum, there's like-mindedness and some degree of connection. The question is, are they the same group with just sort of, you know, think in corporate terms. Is it one, is it one conglomerate and this is a subdivision? Is it that model? Is it just like-minded people who share some, some terminology and branding? And, and that's an empirically uh, testable question, um, but we're not going to be able to decide it, what the measure of it is, by looking at the AUMF. So um, let me jump back in. So I've, I've given you Judge Leon with acceptance of membership and support. Judge Walton does not like support and has a pretty narrow calibration of what the membership test ought to be. Um, Judge Bates then in the Hamlili case, let me show you the change again. Um, he also, like Judge Walton, rejects the idea of independent support and accepts the idea of membership as the test. But he does something pretty clever here. He says, you know, a lot of the conduct that one might describe as mere support, you know, you're providing some money, you're providing some training, you may not have a card in your wallet that says Al-Qaeda member since 1999. <laughs> in fact, you probably don't. But your support makes you a functional member. And so Judge Bates, I think, rather cleverly suggested <laughs> there's not as much difference between these two tracks as it seems that on the surface that there is. But nonetheless, it's ultimately got to be the case that you're a member in his, in his model. There's to the, the problem of, of someone who may be like-minded but ultimately is independent doesn't count. And he's, and he's careful to add that you do need also to be in the chain of command, addressing the concern you expressed a moment ago. You've got to be in the chain of command. It's not just that you're like-minded. Um, he notably doesn't say anything about being part of the combat apparatus. So as to the combat wing versus non-combat wings, he, he implicitly disregards that. So now we have a third position. Then we get a fourth position quickly now from Judge Urbina, who says he's following Judge Bates. But he also goes further and emphasizes that you must actually execute orders. It's not enough to say that notionally you're subject to, to uh, the chain of command. You have to, there's got to be some background that you actually have been following orders. Arguably a distinct uh, fourth position, and then definitely a distinct fifth position. Judge uh, Havel and Bassard holds that it doesn't matter what your past conduct and associations were if you would not likely return to the fight if released. So she introduces the separate notion of a prospective dangerousness test. A th an element that sort of you layer in above whatever the underlying necessary conditions for detention are. So arguably five positions now. You got to get to the DC circuit, of course, to see, you know, surely the circuit will make it all better, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I clerked on the district court, the judge had this uh, mock opinion, a per curiam reversal from the, the second circuit that was, you know, it was all fake, but it said, uh, for the opinion stated by the district judge below, the opinion is reversed. <laughs> <laughs> captures the notion. So the circuit steps in, and, the, and the, the big case was in January this year, Al Bahani, a panel decision, uh, Brown and Kavanaugh in the majority, Williams in, in partial dissent, uh, appealing from Judge Leon, and they said, uh, Judge Leon's got it right. It's a two-track model. This idea that support doesn't count, that's wrong. It, it all counts, and membership support, either one's fine. Of course, this business about support counting, that was dicta in this case. There was further language, though, that was really alarming to some people, where the court said international law and suspe specifically the law of armed conflict are irrelevant to this question. We should only look to statutes and any prior American case law. Don't look at anything else. And then further, they said in, in further dicta, um, it's probably enough if the fact pattern shows someone received training from one of these groups or even stayed at a guest house. That alone would prove it, detainability. Now, this is all dicta, but it's really different and arguably marks a broad, I'd say that's even broader than what Judge Leon had been saying, probably a sixth position. And then just to make it even more fun, eventually, uh, th so the petitioners moved for en banc review. Uh, they did not get en banc review, but a majority of the active judges of the D.C. Circuit in denying en banc review did actually say, all this business is dicta. <laughs> and so signaling that none of that really counted anyway. So it's just sort of out there but not binding and therefore not clarifying things. Um, let me just tap through really quickly. I don't want to spend the time to lay this all out there. There have been a, period, a series of decisions that have rejected the requirement of chain of command and re rejected the re requirement of future dangerousness. 
It's happening in a couple of cases, as you're seeing here in these slides. Um, and then a very curious thing happened in, in something called the Bensaya litigation. Bensaya was the one remaining detainee from the Boumedian litigation who's still in custody. Judge Leon had said he could be held as a supporter. So his case, unlike all these others, actually presented the independent support scenario. And uh, change of administration while it was up on appeal. And the new administration, according to reporting by Charlie Savage of the New York Times, divided internally on whether to continue to advance the support argument. And the temporary ceasefire solution they came up with was, uh, we won't continue to argue for Ben Saya himself to be detained as a supporter. We'll argue to the court that he's a functional member. And, we'll, and they say this in a letter to the court that concludes with a statement that, by the way, we're not waiving this argument as to other people. We're still fighting about it. We might yet assert it in other cases. So now the administration itself is internally divided on whether to keep the independent support prong. All right. Um, the district court reactions have all essentially sort of thrown up their hands and have moved towards a we know it when we see it kind of standard. There's, there's, there's quibbling and fighting about whether guest house attendance alone proves anything. Uh, there's dicta in several of these cases that don't actually turn on it, but refer to the language about support, saying I guess that counts now. And what I'm suggesting to you is at the end of this all, we've come back to square one. Right? We're right back where we started, not knowing what the test is. So now let me talk about whether this matters and whether we should care, and then let's hear some thoughts about what, we should, what if anything, we should do about it. Let me argue to you that it matters for a couple of reasons. <coughs> Sorry, I need to stay near my mic, I was told. Um, First of all, it obviously matters in the individual cases that are subject to habeas review at Guantanamo. It's, in my view, unfair both to the detainees and to the government that at the moment, the substantive standard really does seem to depend on which judge you are slotted to. And although it is true, and I want to be clear, that the vast majority of cases decided so far have turned on whether or not the evidence is credible. They don't turn on what the substantive scope of detention is. You know, we haven't seen all the cases yet. There are many more to come, and it's certainly possible that coming down the pipe are many cases that may turn on precisely this issue. Now, you could say, well, that may be or that may not be, but I don't care either because I think the appellate process eventually will work its magic and finally give us clarity, or Guantanamo is a small set of cases anyways, and it doesn't seem to matter that much in the existing cases. Um, I don't think that's an adequate attitude. One, I think that we need answers sooner rather than later. And two, I don't think it's just about Guantanamo, and the, and the reason why is related. First of all, uh, the Guantanamo detainees are finite in number, at least for now. But in light of you know, how national politics have gone the past couple of years, are you really so sure that Guantanamo has seen the last prisoner arrive there? Are you so sure that habeas is only about Guantanamo in any event? There's been litigation going on for a couple of years now as to whether the same habeas review process should apply uh, first at Bagram Air Base and now at what's called the detention facility in Parwan, the DFIP. That's the Afghanistan detention facility we operate, where there are many more people in custody there than there are in Guantanamo these days. Uh, should, will it apply there? The, a district judge had said, well, it should apply. Habeas review and jurisdiction should apply for people who are brought there from elsewhere, but not for people who are captured in Afghanistan, because that's, that's more like a conventional war. But if you, if you capture some guy in the Sudan or wherever, and you bring him there, then that guy should be, sub his, his case should be subject to judicial review. A DC Circuit panel overturned that decision and said, no habeas. But, an important language qualifying that holding, they said, no habeas because there's no reason to think that the petitioners in that case who'd been brought in from elsewhere back before 2008 in Boumediene, indeed before 2004 in the first case where the Supreme Court suggested there was habeas at Guantanamo, there was no reason to think the, the government was playing hide the ball from jurisdiction with these detainees back then. They said if, if, the case, if the fact pattern were to arise in the future where the government has captured someone outside of Afghanistan and brings them there, fresh issue, we'll look at it afresh. Dollars to donuts, they'd say ultimately there is jurisdiction. So habeas very possibly would expand to that location or any other. In any event, even if habeas does not attach, and there's no judicial review, if you're a staff judge advocate and you're advising a commander at the DFIP as to who may be detained and who may not be detained, and you're aware because you're on my listserv or you, you, would watch, you download this lecture and you're watching this and you say, oh my gosh, there's all these rules about what the scope of detention authority is under the AUMF, and even though we're not subject to habeas review, as far as I can tell, we're operating under color of the AUMF, are you going to ignore all this and not tell your commander, not factor that into your legal advice? No, of course you're going to factor it in. And the DOD General Counsel's Office is going to do the same thing. So it has a shadow effect even where jurisdiction does not attach. 
Oh, and by the way, that same staff judge advocate leaves the detention meeting and goes over to the targeting cell and hears about plans to target some particular individual. And it's an individual who's not a member of, but is a supporter of one of these groups. And let's say that the most recent statement from the courts is that independent supporters are not even subject to detention. But you can kill them? Probably not. You now, there's a shadow cast over targeting as well. For good or ill, I'm not suggesting that this is good or bad. What, what I am criticizing is uncertainty. I don't think it's fair to that staff judge advocate, let alone the commanders who have to make these decisions, that they don't know what the test is. And we ought to know. So let, let me stop there. I've, I've gone on way too long. I'd, I'd love to talk further. I hope you guys have lots of questions. Um, the microphones are circulating, and I'm, I'm to remind you that uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'll call on you, but wait till the microphone gets to you. And I, I think Robert's going to call. Uh, you know what? To. I'll let you do it. Okay. <laughs> That's um, even better. Because I'll aggressively police. Don't ask your question until the microphone gets to you. This is being webcast, so we want to, we want the audience, to, uh, the broader audience, to hear your question. Um, questions. I'll assume silence means you all agree with me on every single thing. <laughs> Hi, um, you uh, brought up uh, ab about uh, material support as a, as a criteria for, for, for detaining somebody. Um, there, there was a, a material support case of a, of a U.S. citizen, okay, Lynn Stewart, Mm. who was, um, it, it, it was claimed that, that, that she v violated uh, paragraph 2339B, mm -hmm. um, and she, she was sentenced to, uh, to, to two months or uh, two years in, and four months in, in prison. Uh, what advice could you give to, to attorneys? Uh, who who were de de defending people uh, 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 accused of uh, of of having ties with with terrorism uh, who might want to give a, a a robust defense for their clients, but but yet may want to steer clear of uh, of violating two three three nine B. That's such a good question. I'm really glad you raised that. Um, so Lynn Stewart was an attorney who represented uh, the, the, the famous so-called blind sheikh uh, and uh, was ultimately uh, charged with material support in connection with things she had, the, the jury ultimately concluded she had done to assist him in, getting, in communicating messages to his followers. And it raises, and this is almost more a question about federal criminal law, even more so than the risk of military detention. It's really the question of, you might get prosecuted because this business of support, it's a federal criminal offense since 1996 to provide material support defined very broadly to any designated foreign terrorist organization. And absolutely, the hard, I think the hardest question is, if you push that logic to its limits, how in the world can attorneys represent people? Now, you, you can get waivers. You can, you can go to the State Department and get, and get waivers uh, for particular cases. And the ACLU, for example, has, has sought a license and ultimately did get a license from, I believe, the State Department so that it can act on behalf of, of Al-Alaki, the guy who's been the American citizen in Yemen we were talking about a moment ago, so they could litigate essentially on his behalf. Um, but I think we should all pause at the notion that an attorney should have to get a license from the government in order to, to litigate. Um, I mean, frankly, I think it would be nice and appropriate if the statute were modified to make it clear, without having to have constitutional litigation about it, that providing legal services and, and, and representing a client, perhaps that, that is some kind of carve out from the statute so you don't have to litigate over it. But as, as it currently stands, providing expert advice or assistance, or under, a, there are several related <laughs> statutes providing services to these effectively embargoed groups, you run a huge risk. And so the, the, the advice I give, the, the legal, I guess I shouldn't be giving legal advice on a webcast thing, but yeah. <laughs> whatever, I'm a professor. Take it for what it's worth. You, it's worth what you pay for. <laughs> Go get the license. Go get the license. Don't take risks in this area. I'm sorry, I sit here listening to you this whole time, and um, I'm thinking if the English had done this in uh, 1974, when Bobby Sands was in prison in Belfast, and in 1976 I went to a dance in Euclid, 
then found myself on a flight to London. MI5 could have picked me off just like that because it would have been material support for an international conflict. Yeah. A whole lot of people in America who <laughs> gave money. A whole lot of people gave money. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, for one, I didn't notice it in any of the footnotes. Now, a lot of that stuff in England is being dealt with as police misconduct or military misconduct, and apologies are forthcoming mm -hmm. about that, but no real law on the subject. With that in mind, has anybody made the argument that this use of Military Force Act is not only like fraught with difficulty in sending us down all these strange roads, but might be altogether unconstitutional in the first instance. Tell me a little bit more about what you have in mind about why it might be unconstitutional. Well, Just to make sure I understand you. Congress abdicating to the, to the executive to say, here, you do what you like, and then you know, we're, it's pretty raw. And now we're backtracking and trying to dress it up. Right, try to flesh it out. Which makes yeah. maybe people feel better about it, but it's pretty raw. Yeah, you raised a couple of really good points. I mean, let me take them in sequence. So the, uh, one, of the, one of the questions is, uh, you know, does what it, we've just described, doesn't this map on to say, imagine the number of people in Boston alone who provided material support and resources to the IRA. And very, and very proudly so they did it, right? They, you know, closed, dropped the blinds, locked the front door, and passed the hat around while talking about, you know, the, the fight. Um, when the material support, so this is more a question of, there's two questions here. One, does, does this model mean that those people can be detained militarily? Second, back to the earlier question, does that mean they can be prosecuted in regular criminal law? Because this concept of support is used in both contexts. Um, the key thing to appreciate about this uh, detention question is, of course, this whole argument is predicated on the idea that Congress has authorized the use of force against particular groups. Now, that gets us to your second question about, well, how they didn't really spell it out that much. I'll come to that in a second. But let's work with the argument that if you've identified the group, that does act as a limit, right? There's never been an AUMF that plausibly applies to the IRA or the PIRA today or ETA or any number of other groups. So these concepts, you shouldn't leave here thinking, my God, that means that they can mil militarily detain anyone who gives money to you know, the Shining Path or to the Tamil Tigers or what have you. They, the AUMF is itself, it does have this limit. But that just brings us to your second question. And I'll, I'll come back to the prosecution point in a second. Um, you certainly could be prosecuted because once you get to 1996 and whatever year after 1996 the IRA gets designated, it eventually does. I mean, eventually the bureaucratic process designates these groups and then at that point um, you're subject to it. The AOMF, uh, however, uh, I got confused about your points. You, you were asking about whether the AMF is essentially unconstitutional because it's so vague and it's such a blank check, right? Um, right. And, and the, you know, the I'm also referring to, excuse me, I'm also yeah. referring to English authority to detain an American citizen. Ah, yeah, I mean, this could be put, the shoe could be put on the other foot. Right. Uh, that, nothing I can say to that other than, yeah, every, we need to always be mindful that whatever positions we're staking out here can be used by other governments and we can criticize in response, but we'll always have the problem of the two-edged sword with the arguments we've advanced. Um, on, uh, well, why don't I just leave it at that? Okay, but that's that's great points you've raised. And this is kind of a follow-up to that question, and it's and and I I appreciate how you've couched your arguments very objectively, uh, very being very careful to not be right or left and to just succinctly look at the law and how it was written and how it was applied Caught me. and how it is being applied <laughs> to the extent that you could and and I think and that is a breath of fresh air I think one of the great regrets of all of us in the law is you know the complete politicization of the Supreme Court in almost every facet of our political public dialogue that's an aside I'm just wondering from you know uh, like you said you're not giving advice you're a professor and to just get rid of the facade and talk about did America seven or eight days after 9-11, just abandon our core principles. And this no. law is an example 
and now we're trying to piece it together afterwards. No. Um, I, I certainly don't think, it, you, you specifically said, you know, seven or eight days afterwards, in, in <laughs> the decision to, to authorize use of force and to use military force, um, I think would have been a dereliction of duty not to use military force to go into Afghanistan. Um, where I would agree with the sentiment you've expressed to some extent is on the torture issue. There, if, you, if we want to talk about that, which is a very, yeah, right, if that's what you're talking about, then, you know, clearly there's, there's been a huge break with our values. But, um, but I don't see the one as following from the other. And if we're talking about who may be detained and, and where we should be using force and whether there was some need to use military force, I, for my own personal view, there's clearly a need to use some military force. That doesn't mean it's always the right solution or that we didn't use it too broadly or hold you know, people in circumstances where we shouldn't, but those, are, those go to the details. But in general, I don't think the initial decisions were in any way inconsistent with our values. Back to the blank check idea. Though. Oh, yeah. I didn't answer that completely. Okay. Right. No, what I'm just saying is that's where I'm, I'm seeing this abdication of our, is we just went yeah. to an autocrat. We said, Mr. Autocrat, do what you do, and he'll just wait. Well, so I don't think that the problems, you know, it's interesting. The political branches, where, where does the, the fault here come to rest? The last couple of questions have pointed the finger a little bit at Congress. Why doesn't Congress act more specifically. Why don't they, and, and personally, one of the things I'm advocating for with, with this larger project of describing the uncertainty is that Congress can do something about this. I'm not naive. I'm not convinced they would actually be able to or willing to do something useful about it. But I'd like to think, I'd like to think still, maybe I'm too optimistic, that somehow it's possible our legislature could step up. But it's very convenient, not just in this area, but in so many of our toughest national debates, to preserve a position in which elected officials can take whatever position they need to after the chips are played and say, aha, well, this is terrible. But in the meantime, the judges will police things. And at least one senator said during the debate over the original Military Commissions Act, something to the effect that, I, you know, I, I have my doubts whether this is constitutional, but that's for the courts to decide. But that's not right. That's not what I teach my con law students, and it's not what anyone should think. We all have a responsibility. So I, I, I do think there's been some dereliction of duty. Yeah. Um, just, and to finish, you had said, you know, is this constitutional to be this blank and open? Uh, putting on the, our con law hats, the non-delegation doctrine requires only an intelligible principle. And even in the domestic sphere, the courts have never given this any teeth. It's often said in law school that non-delegation doctrine has no teeth at all, especially in foreign affairs. So you may be right about the policy problem with this. The courts almost certainly wouldn't do anything about it. Um, if it's any comfort. Uh, it is a soon-to-be former senator who said that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that's on, why the vote. On that note, um, <laughs> I first of all want to thank Bobby Chesney. Um, we have learned here that branding is important, and um, <laughs> Ooh, it's called and too. if we can uh, somehow enlist uh, visitors to brand for us all the better. Uh, so with our thanks, um, you will get a wonderful fleece with I love the it. insignia of the Institute for Global Security Law and Policy. Uh, please join me in thanking Bobby Chesney and <laughs>